Finally, we are with the equality constraints. We have seen a little example for that with the soft constraints last time for fitting the ellipse. And today we will look at hard equality constraints where I am not fuzzy and I allow some small deviations. Today we have equality constraints. We need the solution to be exactly constrained by, by some equality uh, in an equation. Let's motivate this historically. So historically there have been a couple of um, important examples that is today subsumed under the category of optimal transport problems. And let's, let's look at two examples that were developed at roughly the same time. So the first one is uh, called the, the Kantorovic problem. We already heard about Kantorovic a couple of times. Uh, again, this is the same Kantorovic. And um, in this problem, uh, the Red Army General, so we are in the Second World War, and the Red Army General, he wants to move his troops from the barracks to the front line with minimal effort. So here we have um, the, the barracks where the soldiers are trained, and here I have 60, thousand soldiers, here I have 90,000 and here I have 150,000 and then there are a couple of frontline positions and I want to move the trained soldiers to the frontline positions and the question is what is the most effective way of, of moving these soldiers? So think about this like um, a problem of planning um, trains. So maybe you need one train for every thousand soldiers or something and then how, by, how many trains do you need and how can you effectively transport them. Um, a very similar problem was, um, uh, was published by, by Hitchcock and uh, this is a little bit more peaceful. So he's talking about a farmers cooperative and they want to deliver their produce to different markets. So one of the farmers is making uh, carrots and the other farmer is, um, is uh, growing cabbage and then we have different needs at different markets and somehow they also need to transport their, their goods around and want to fulfill the market demand at every location with minimal transport cost or, or transport overhead. And um, this is both of them are examples of the optimal transport problem they are pretty similar, they are actually the same problem but from a different application perspective and in the 1940s people were very interested in solving these kinds of problems. So um, we will for this lecture uh, follow the uh, Kantorovic problem as, as a motivating example. Um, if you are pacifist, I'm sorry for that, um, this is more of an unhappy problem uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's a historical motivation for a lot of things and uh, this is for us just an, an application example and uh, also in, 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 in the historical development oftentimes it were examples like that that uh, permitted researchers then to have the funds to, to develop something much more, much more general. Okay, so how can we formalize this optimization problem? So again, we have the barracks with the numbers of soldiers, uh, so 60, 90 and 150,000 and our fighting positions um, where we have a certain requirements. And um, then I, I am just giving them an index. So the barracks, I am calling them um, B1, B2 and B3. And likewise for the positions, I'm calling them P1, P2 and P3. And um, then I can express how many soldiers are moved from a certain barrack to a certain position um, in, in a matrix. So here I have a matrix M and then I can express how many soldiers are moving from the first barracks to the first position or from the second, um, second barracks to the third position and so on. So I can just fill this matrix with, uh, with the soldiers that are moved, obviously all the entries should be larger than zero. And um, in addition, I have certain costs. So the first position and the first barracks, they are very close to one another, so uh, my cost is only one. But if I then would move soldiers from the second barrack to the third, posi third position, they are far away or uh, the, the train line is not so good. And uh, then I imagine to have a cost of, of seven units there. So here we are expressing our costs and also the possible solutions by, by matrices. 
Okay, and now we have to stage the underlying optimization problem. So we are looking for a 3x3 three three matrix um, that is minimizing our movement cost. And for all the barracks and for all the positions, I'm multiplying here the number of soldiers moved between the barrack and the position times the cost for that movement. Yeah, so here, um, effectively, I have nine entries here uh, for the i and the j all going from one to three. So uh, I have, I'm effectively summing over nine entries, multiplying the number of moved soldiers times the cost. And then I have certain equality constraints, so things that have to hold for all the possible solutions. So here I say I'm looking for a 3x3 three three matrix, but I'm not looking for any 3x3 three three matrix. I'm constraining it with a couple of equality constraints. For example, if I sum over all the soldiers moving out of the first barrack, so these are the, uh, the entries of the matrix M in the first row, then this has to be equal to the sum of these entries has to be equal to zero. And likewise for the second row 90, for the third row 150, and so on. And um, um, in addition to that, the soldiers, wait a sec, did I, was this correct? Oh no, of course here I'm I'm summing over over the first um, yeah, over the first row. Okay, and then the soldiers moving into P1. So the soldiers moving into the first position, I want to have 120 soldiers at this position. So if I sum over all these um, entries uh, in the first column, uh, that has to be 120. Okay, so here I have a bunch of equality constraints so that in the end all the soldiers are moved and all the, um, the final positions are fulfilled and I cannot take more soldiers out of the first um, barracks than are initially there and uh, in order to make to ensure that uh, I also have the constraint that all the movements has to have to be larger than zero. Okay and uh, this is a linear program because here the objective function the objective term up here this is a linear term and uh, now let's bring this into a more standard form. So now this is looking quite complicated I have a lot of different constraints and um, um, let's bring this in standard form that makes it more easy to reason about that and to develop algorithms for that. Hmm? Okay, what we do now is we get away from the matrix representation and we write down this as an optimization problem for a nine-dimensional vector. So we had our matrix um, M, which was a which was a three by three matrix, uh, but now to get this problem into a standard form, we instead represent it as a nine-dimensional vector x. So here we have um, our elements M11, M12, M13, but then also M21, and so on. Okay. Um, and um, but here let's think about what 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 we usually do because uh, the Julia language is doing that for us is uh, in our matrix we have the the column vectors and we are stacking the column vectors on top of each other so actually what I would have here is here I have m11 then I have m21 m31 and then continuing by m um, one, two, and, and so on. So here we are taking the, the columns of our matrix and we are stacking the columns on top of each other for our vector representation. And now we have a nine dimensional vector and uh, we are optimizing in this nine dimensional space. Uh, okay, and uh, the same we do for the cost matrix. So then we have a nine dimensional cost vector in the end, uh, our target function, our objective function, is just um, our cost vector transposed times x. And this is, again, a, a linear uh, optimization problem subject to a couple of constraints. And uh, what do we do with the constraints? 
So here we have this sum um, of all the soldiers moving from the first barracks has to be equal to 60 and so on. And this can be represented um, by also some um, vector multiplication. So now we are only looking here at the first row of this matrix. And the first row of this matrix here, um, it has entries 1 at the places where I have um, the, the soldiers moving out of the first barracks in my solution vector x. So if I multiply the first column of this matrix by x, um, I get exactly all the soldiers moving out of the first barracks in, in the solution x. And I constrain this to be equal to 60. And the same I can also do for all the soldiers moving out of the second barracks or all the soldiers moving into the first fighting position, uh, things like that. And, uh, and then I have this matrix vector multiplication for my equality constraint and I in the end have uh, one remaining inequality constraint so that all my x, so the elements of my solution x have to be greater or equal to zero. Okay, what we have seen right now with this matrix vector multiplication is uh, an affine equality constraint. So in general, in the, in the most general setting, we could say that we have an optimization problem f of x and we have some inequality constraints, we saw them last time, and today we also add a couple of equality constraints. And uh, we could say, well, the equality constraints, they can be whatever. So, um, uh, so if we didn't have a need for convexity, for example, uh, then we could say we have a constraint uh, that we have our um, x1, so an element of the solution, squared should be 1. So uh, this is a possible, um, uh, or then um, we, we could write this down a little bit differently. We could then write down to say h1 of x is x1 squared minus 1. And this then should be 0. So this could be an equality constraint. However, this doesn't work for us because the solution space would no longer be convex. Uh, because there are here, we have two possible solutions for that. So here we have the solution um, um, x1 equals 1. And here we also have the solution x1 equals minus 1. And um, this is a, a non-convex um, solution space that is remaining here. Uh, because I cannot take a combination, a linear combination, in between these two possible solutions and um, our algorithms that we're exploring in this course would no longer hold. Yeah? So whenever I have a non-convex constraint, so that here my, my the, the possible solutions lie here on in some space, uh, but the space is non-convex, then I have a problem with the uh, with the, with the algorithms developed in this lecture. Therefore, we only allow um, affine equality constraints. And affine here means I have some vector aj transpose times x minus bj equals to zero, and all my equality constraints have to be in that form. That means I uh, here define effectively some uh, subspace on which, uh, or uh, this is sometimes called a linear variation, um, and uh, my, my solutions have to lie on this space, therefore I can take any combination lying between the two, and th those would also be valid solutions, so my, my solution space remains convex. Okay, but uh, since I'm only allowing these affine equality constraints, I can combine all my affine equality constraints into uh, a single ex equation ax equals to b. So I can compress all my equality constraints into one single um, yeah, constraint exactly of that form. And uh, you can think about this as the solutions being constrained to the intersection of half spaces. So um, let's say here this is my first 
the first row of my matrix. So here I have my matrix A and uh, here I have my first row of the matrix here is the green line and then the second line, a row of my matrix together with some scalar bj um, is the second equality constraint and it would look like this and now effectively I have, would have constrained my solution to be exactly here but of course in a, in a higher dimensional solution space these would not be lines but these would be planes or hyperplanes and therefore I would still have some uh, range of possible solutions lying in the intersection of these two equality constraints.